All right, here we go. John Sinclair, welcome to my podcast, mate. How are you? Great, bud. Thanks for having me. Excited to be yeah, here. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, listen, bold, renowned strength coach, and uh, you're on our app, Any Question. How are you liking it so far? It's amazing. It's like I've never been a social media fan. Mm -hmm. I'm not someone who like pumps my chest and, hey, listen to me kind of thing. So I love that, you know, I, we get to actually answer people's questions and yeah. uh, and give an authentic response through you know, our own perspective, we're all going to have a different perspective when we read a question. And so um, that's what I think has been the most enjoyable for me is just getting an opportunity to authentically give a response to somebody that's genuinely looking for the information, you know? Yeah. Well, I think what I love about your answers too, is you actually demonstrate. So you'll, you'll say what the question is, and then you'll move back and you'll start to demonstrate the answer and talk me through it and walk me through it. And I think that's really an important part of the learning process for me is actually seeing it too. And you do a fantastic job of that. Oh, thanks. I mean, I guess all the years of educating and coaching, you're used to doing that anyways, right? So if someone asks you a question or you're trying to demonstrate or try to find a, um, a reason or a justification why we might do a particular movement or why this might be important for increasing your performance, um, it just kind of comes with the territory that, you know, you want to give a concise answer that makes as much or that is as clear as possible to give mm. people that the outcome that they're looking for. Right. In coaching, yeah. you don't have a lot of time to say a lot, as you know. So what you say really matters. Right. Well, I'll yeah. tell you this. One of the things I learned early on as a coach, because I didn't know how to coach swimming. I knew what a, what a coach was. You know, I, I went from being a professional athlete to, auto, uh, you know, straight away going on to being a coach. And I didn't know what that meant exactly. So I had to learn that, when you demonstrate, the swimmers would actually mimic the way that I would demonstrate. So if I was to demonstrate a particular drill with my head up, but I actually wanted them to have their head down, I found that they would do the drill with their head up. And I'm like, no, 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 I wanted you to have your head down. I just needed to speak to you. And they were like, well, because you had your head up, that's what I thought you wanted. So then I had to get very, very technical and very precise with the way I was demonstrating. And I think that's what, again, what I like about what you do on the app is that you do the movement exactly the way you want it to be and look. And so it's easy to follow along and learn then. Yeah, I think that's what's kind of cool. I think I've had the opportunity to work with a lot of different athletes at different levels. And one of the challenges that we have is when the more elite or world-class you are, the more you can get real detailed about things because people have had the experience to be able to decipher that, decipher that information and then mm. put it into a context for themselves. But I also work with a lot of amateur athletes. And so mm. like kids in high school or even middle school. Mm. And with them, you can't really say a lot, right? Because that's not how our brain picks up information. It, it doesn't have the context to know how to filter that. But if I give a visual image uh, and a visual representation of what we're doing, then and give them just here's where we start, here's where we end. Don't say anything about how we get there then mm. they'll start to self-organize, right? So mm. their nervous system self-organizes, their uh, patterns self-organize, and then they find out how to get there with their style. And I think that's what we're missing as coaches is we're trying to teach the right way instead of finding, here's where you start, here's where you end, and let that person's own style find their way in there. And then as they get more proficient, then we start to get more technical with our strategies and coaching. Yeah. Look, strength and conditioning is such a vital part of, of any sport, right? And, and it's, it's no different in swimming. I think the thing is that no one really understands where it starts and how it should start, right? Like, I think there's varying opinions, let's say, and views and, and people not fully understanding. I'm sure parents are, are very confused too. Like, look, my kid's a swimmer. When should they start strength training or even conditioning training? And and how often and how and what. And, and so there's no real uniform consensus on, you know, swim coaches doing it a particular way. Generally what it's been is kind of attaching themselves to some type of gym, local gym, bringing in somebody, or even the at times the swim coach may be doing a lot of the strength and conditioning, especially the conditioning side, let's say, themselves. So what's your opinion on kind of when it should start and how it should start for a particular age group? So really when we think about strength training, one of the biggest challenges that we have to overcome as strength and conditioning coaches is that 
um, I think there's a, um, a magnet and attachment of strength training with weight training, mm. right? And so um, at some of the highest levels, we start to introduce things like, you know, explosive type of activities like clean and jerks and snatches, which mm. is interesting to me because that's another sport, right? But mm. because it's weights, people attach weight training to getting stronger, which yes, that does happen. But the most important thing that we can do is realize that strength is a quality, right? It's just one of the qualities of athleticism that we try to work on. And yes, we can do it in the gym, but we can do it outside of the gym also. So, well, with strength training, there's a bit of a stigma that anything that we do with strength training usually has to do with weight training. And as we get more proficient at weight training, we start to introduce more complex motor tasks with weights. And mm -hmm. so sometimes that looks like Olympic weightlifting, which is another sport altogether. So doing clean and jerk and snatch, and then that gets labeled as, well, that's weight training and strength training. Yeah. And so the challenge now is that we've got media, you got social media, you have other coaches, you've got uh, certification bodies, you have all these people that are applying exercises in the world of strength, which is part of it, but then it creates confusion amongst the masses and they think, well, when does my kid need to start weight training? Mm. And you may not, but you may need to. And so the, the best part about that is trying to determine, well, what elements of athleticism do we need to express in this particular athlete? And then what are our tools that will allow that to happen? So if I need somebody that needs more mobility, well, if I do isolated strength training exercise for you, that may not be the best way to deliver mobility because that's a quality that you need to work on in with athleticism. But if strength and power are something that you need, there's a gazillion exercises we can apply. It's just making sure that we apply the right stimulus at the right time for that one individual's development. So you could say, well, this age group should start weight training at this age and for these reasons, and then that will benefit their performance. And yeah. it that's not necessarily an accurate statement. What's more accurate is saying, what is the athlete really good at? What activities do they do outside of, let's say, swimming? Um, are do they play other sports? How are those? How do they express athleticism? And then how do we improve their motor skill system so that it shows up in the pool? And yeah. so that's the approach I've always taken. And sometimes it's lifting weights, and sometimes it's throwing a ball, and sometimes it's um, expressing different movement patterns that they wouldn't see or i know i did that one video where i'm jumping rope as cross training for mm. for a swimmer and that's a great thing to do because we don't interact with the ground when we spend i don't know 20 30 hours in the pool every week right so we need to express those things because that's how i keep my connective tissue resilient so doing something like a jump rope is going to be a great dry land program to help offset the environment that they spend so much time in so there's a lot more to engineers as we look at it from a strength and conditioning standpoint it's not just what weights do i lift to strengthen what muscles which will therefore show up in the pool i kind of take the approach of what is the motor task i need to get better at why do i need to get better at that motor task and how will that translate into the pool and then strength as a quality is we improve that by improving efficiency and economy with that movement and then applying load to make you resilient enough to handle the stresses of your training. Yeah, it, it actually sounds very similar to the way that I approach uh, improving a swimmer. You know, like someone will say to me, what's a drill that I can do? And I'm like, well, what's the context? Who's the swimmer? How good are they? What What's their skill level? <laughs> you know, like I can just give you a drill. There's a million drills, but it's like, right. how does that actual, actual drill going to apply to that swimmer to make them better? And so it's very, it's very, sometimes people criticize me either on the podcast or maybe even in some of my answers where they're like, oh, you're so vague. I'm like, how can I be direct if I have no idea exactly who I'm talking to? So it ha has to be kind of a vague uh, overview until I can have that swimmer in front of me to say, well, there's the deficiency. That's where you need that specific improvement, right? So I guess it's the same in strength training too. Yeah, 100%. I mean, if you don't have context to a question, how do you know really where to answer it? And so with any question, is it what's a good exercise for warming up your shoulder, for example? Well, it depends. Like, what is the task for the day? What is it I'm trying to prepare that shoulder for? 
right? So yeah, there's lots of different exercises that I could do to warm up the shoulder and to prepare the tissues and to prime the nervous system. But I need to know what is it that we're trying to work on today? Am I a freestyle 50 meter sprinter, uh, swimmer <laughs> versus a, you know, 2000 meter breaststroker? I mean, I don't even know. If that's yeah. what that is, but, you know, <laughs> no, like, thank God it's not. No. <laughs> so the idea is like, what is it? That, what is it that we're trying yeah. to do? And in the strength and conditioning world, we really do have to blame the fitness industry and the strength and conditioning world because we've become very um, tribalistic, if you will. Like, this is what I do and this is how they do it. And then you follow this particular tribe and then mm. or this particular certification. And we've kind of lost sight of, well, there's all these sciences that we know about, but we're not applying them because we're looking at it through the lens of exercise, not through the lens of, well, how do yeah. I bioengineer this organic mass of tissues and, and that's made up of all these systems and that each human being is completely unique, you know? And yeah, that, yeah. So exactly. how do I pick one exercise when every human being is unique, right? Yeah, exactly. I think there's two industries that I've found would be really tough to be in at times, and that's the strength and conditioning and then the nutrition and yeah. health type, you know, like everybody's got their own opinions on food and there are so many different uh, ways to attack it. And there are so many expert, you know, so-called experts out there. And then, and then strength and conditioning is the same, especially with the, with the, uh, you know, the advent of uh, you know, social media where everybody's got an opinion and everybody's an expert in this and that. But um, yeah, I think, I think the thing is um, accreditation and experience uh, really, really go a long way. So in terms of that, like what, what have you done to kind of, go through your accreditations to, to gain the type of knowledge that you have right now? Yeah, so I started with my uh, degree in physical education and sport performance from the University of Alberta, and I graduated in 1999. And uh, while I was going through my undergrad, I was coaching um, amateur kids in baseball and hockey. And and then as I, I was a 14 sport athlete in high school, so I played just about everything. And 14 and sports? I didn't know there was 14 sports. <laughs> yeah well i did that because i grew up in small town saskatchewan in canada and you know there's only like 300 people there so uh if you were going to have a team everybody had to play <laughs> and so uh, um, i was a pretty good but, athlete and john we need you over here buddy so john's also going to be your power hitter in vol <laughs> volleyball and i'm five foot four so i had to learn how to jump um so like that was the cool part is that i i played so many sports that my love mm. for sport and just play in general made me want to go study it and then after I got my degree, um, you know, it's a nonstop learning process. I've been coaching mm -hmm. now for 25 years, probably accumulated like 25 different accreditations um, from some of the uh, top certification bodies in the world um, in sport and in fitness and in health. Um, and now I teach an accredited um, uh, a certification that's called the Applied Health and Human Performance Certification that we built at the Institute of Motion. So I've been an educator for uh, for the industry for better part of like 13 years now and have done lots mm. of workshops teaching coaches and going out and learning from the best, coming back, teaching. And I was faculty for a company called PGA Global. And then we started the Institute of Motion and now I have a company called Seven Movements. And so it's really about us trying to create education, but also, you know, I'm doing anywhere from two to three certifications every year, just myself. How, how do you know the difference between what's a good certification and what isn't? Yeah, it's usually by the, the people that write the certifications, right? So mm. I've been in the industry for 25 years and have studied a lot. So I have some great relationships with some amazing people and amazing coaches. You go to these conferences, you get to see them speak, you get to hear, um, you know, follow their path and see where they've studied and who they studied with. And then it's really just a matter of, you know, choosing the certification based on the maybe the individual that's coaching it because you like how they present information and then uh, looking to see how they've accredited that and so some certifications are accredited some are not uh, the accreditation process is very expensive in order to get your certification accredited um, but I think you need to have a blend of you know your most basic accreditations so from the National Strength and Conditioning Association the um, National Academy of Sports Medicine, um, ACE, the American Council of Exercise, all have accredited uh, personal training certifications and variations of them. 
And then you have different uh, organizations all across the world that also put on other workshops and and um, and certificates that aren't necessarily accredited, but are valuable information too. So, what do you think the the simplest way for um, you know high school parents or high school coaches to find someone in their area that is is worthwhile that knows what they're doing and it's not just uh, some some made up you know accreditation or whatever? It is. What's the best way for them to kind of get that verification? You think? Yeah, if you go to many of the, like if you're looking for a coach that's in the strength and conditioning world, um, one of our most, um, I guess you could call it a gold standard of in the strength and conditioning world is the certified strength and conditioning specialist. Mm. Uh, and you would go on the National Strength and Conditioning Association's uh, website and you can go in there and you can find a CSCS. Mm. Uh, and then they'll look in the area. And then when you have your certification, if you're, real smart you'll put your name in the listing so that at least people know where you are or where they can find you so that that's one way of doing it and there's all the organizations in the world have like a find our accredited coach yeah okay introducing our newest sponsor swim tracks swim tracks is the smartest swim specific tracker ever it registers a ton of swim data that is translated into valuable real-time insights it tracks the three most important data points for coaches and swimmers, time, heart rate, and stroke rate. You and your swimmers can now, from just one device, make sure you're training in the correct energy zones with the correct number of strokes. Visit swimtracks.com and schedule your free demo today. That's swimtracks, T-R-A-X-X.com, swimtracks.com. Our strength coach at Auburn used to prefer that the athletes didn't have any formal strength training. Now, he didn't mind them having the conditioning training, like doing circuit work or, um, you know, whatever it is on land, body weight work, things like that. But he preferred to teach them the movements once they got to college. He felt like sometimes they were taught bad habits that it was very difficult to break. Uh, what's your opinion on that? Um. Well, I, I only have a few rules of exercise, and that is all the, there is no really terribly performed exercise unless you're doing it without good rhythm, coordination, and symmetry. Mm -hmm. So more often than not, you're probably not going to hurt yourself. The way that rule... Have you ever met a swimmer? They're pretty useless on the <laughs> land. <laughs> well, there's there's competence, right? So, um, you know, I swimmers would... can't walk up steps without rolling an ankle. <laughs> <laughs> and so the trick, I think, is just trying to, as a coach for myself, is I want to see that the athletes that are in front of me can they demonstrate movement skills without, you know the only way they're going to hurt themselves really is they demonstrate without good rhythm, timing, and coordination. Now, how that shows up though is uh, that the reason for how that poor rhythm or poor coordination or poor symmetry shows up is that we've got something going on in the body that doesn't want to receive force before it produces force. And so that usually means that I'm lacking mobility in, in a certain sequence and or the motor task that I'm asking them to do, their body doesn't know how to coordinate it. And mm -hmm. so if, if the question really comes down to, well, I don't, I'd rather you not learn a power clean because you may have been taught bad habits in a power clean, then yeah, that might stand up. I know I had bad habits until I changed coaches and then I changed, got a new coach and he changed the path of my bar in mm -hmm. Olympic weightlifting. So, I mean, those things come in because certain coaches have a way of, I'm going to teach this one particular technique. And so, but if we're talking about movement tasks themselves, I don't care how you get there as long as the job gets done, right? And that's where we call movement style. And you've probably experienced, you know, certain people have different swimming styles that just mm -hmm. come natural to them. Right. You don't necessarily really want to get in the way of that. Yeah, uh, yeah, definitely. You know, I was okay, big, yeah, I was that makes sense. And, I was a big baseball and hockey player and, and worked with a lot of baseball and hockey players. And one of my mm -hmm. frustrations is that uh, technique coaches are trying to get all the guys to skate exactly the same way or hit a base right, the same right. way. that doesn't make sense to me like mm. the object of the game is still to hit the ball or to be able mm. to skate around the ice you know as mm. efficiently and as economically as possible and so we need to have the same approach in the weight room 
I mean, it makes sense to me. I mean, I just watched the World Series and I saw those batters line up and uh, they all had their own unique you know, way of kind of holding the bat and swinging yeah. and getting in their rhythm. And then same as the pitchers, you know, they, yeah. they come in all shapes and sizes and they've sure. all got a different way to throw the ball, but they're still throwing it 100 miles an hour and still get to the destination at the same same rate. But, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. The frustration to me is that when skill coaches try to teach everybody right. one way, right right and that is this is how you hit a ball well mm -hmm. there's again there's a lot of context to that so yeah. if if the i can hit the ball but where do i want to hit the ball right, right. And so one swing is not going to look exactly the same depending on where i want to put that ball right that makes a lot of sense yeah um in terms of strength for swimmers i mean i don't know how much you know about swimming but obviously they're they're applying a force in the water and they want to hold water i i did find that i went through a period of time where i wanted to get stronger and bulk up but i wasn't able to then transfer that power and and force into the water effectively right like i was just getting muscular and stronger but i was just slipping water i was pushing water and so how do you find that balance between the the strength and kind of that feel and that ease where you want it to be flowing and you want to you want to hold that that power but not uh, be too too bulky with it you know yeah um well i don't know a ton about swimming i'm a competent swimmer in um in high school i got i was a lifeguard and got all my certifications to swim but i was never taught how to swim fast mm. you're taught to swim competently and rescue people so i'm i can swim the problem <laughs> for me is like the question you raise is a really good one because I think what we're what we're struggling to think is that if I get you stronger, that's going to make you better as an athlete. And mm. we don't have any evidence to suggest that that's true, um, especially something as technical as swimming. So if I increase your body mass, mm -hmm. there's a challenge just in itself for you to stay more buoyant right? The, mm. the heavier you weigh and the more muscle you have on, the mm -hmm. harder you have to work to stay yourself, keep yourself in a perfect position to limit drag and produce force and to be able to move within that medium. The medium in the gym is completely different than the medium in the pool. So we have to realize that what we're doing in the gym should be to keep you more resilient and really should be around enhancing and or cross training for the for the event that you're doing so if you're somebody that is a uh, a distance swimmer then you're probably getting a lot of great distance work in the pool what's mm -hmm. something that we could do outside of the pool that would help cross train you so maybe we're doing more anaerobic stuff on a bike just mm -hmm. things to help round out your athleticism and that's really, I think, the approach that we need to take as strength and conditioning coaches is not necessarily always think about, I'm going to give you a 400-pound squat so you can swim faster. That Those don't translate together. Mm. You know what I mean? Mm. And so I think we get caught up in this myth that is, if I do strength training in the gym, this is how you're going to become a better player. And I think we just need to look at it from the perspective is I need to improve your athleticism and make you more resilient so that you can be working on your technique without me getting in the way of it. Right. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. It's a, it's a puzzle, man. It's, it's just a puzzle that you're, you're trying to put the pieces together and there's no, there's no set formula for it and everybody's a little bit different. One, yep. of the, one of the things that I was always trying to figure out is how we could get more powerful and then translate that into the pool. So one of the things we used to do is we would do our gym work in the morning before the swim um, and then we'd go to the pool and we'd do a very short 25 minute, 30, 30 minute transfer of the power. So we would, we would do this, the, the power training in the gym, come in, do a very short warm up because they're, they're pretty warm already from the gym, obviously very short warm up, and then get into transferring that power. So we'll do a lot of resistance work. So we'll do pulley work. We'll do, you know, pulling shoots, pulling power racks, things like that, but very short and explosive type power work. Is that, is that the way to do it, like transferring it that way? Yeah, I mean, that that would make a lot more sense. Like if I'm thinking of needing to pull with my arms, I might use a ski ergometer, right? Mm -hmm. Where I'm trying to pull as hard as I can into some external resistance that is going to get me to have to teach my nervous system to move faster, mm -hmm. under load, 
And then what I might want to do is then I might want to translate it to, all right, let's harness you in the medium that you're in. And can you produce that kind of power while you're in the water as well? And so mm. the, the challenge is always going to be is that anytime you have a change of environment and a change of direction of force and a change in a medium, you there's going to th be things that are lost in translation because the nervous system is trying to find obviously the most efficient way to get the task done. Mm. And every variable that you change can impact the motor skill and the efficiency that happens in that particular motor skill. So a lot of times we have to try and find things that don't interfere and are not so specific under load because that load doesn't exist in the movement skill itself. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Because yeah. if, if I create too much interference, then the nervous system has a hard time differentiating between what is the technique that I'm trying to do here right. and how do I minimize all the things that would be getting in my way. Like if I'm now pulling in my head's coming up a little bit higher because I can access the water from a higher position because that's what I was doing on the ski ergometer, all the power you're working on is actually just being affected by your head popping out of the water right. as an example. So the trick is always just try to find... I've always found that if I do plyometric type training where I'm interacting with the ground mm. and then put them in the pool, we're teaching the nervous system to act with a different medium in, in a different way. And then therefore, when I go back into the water, I'm not going to forget how to swim because it was a completely different environment and context. But at right. the cellular level and at the, at the nervous system level, I enhanced quality of power development and interacting with a different medium. And that's why I like to use this concept. And it's not really anything new. It's called cross training, right? Like every great right. coach in the history of sport uh, was using some variability of in their training and then going very specific when they're in their particular event. So mm. that's the approach I've always taken is, is try to do more cross training. At the Institute of Motion, we created a programming model based on that, and it's called 4Q. And it's just different quadrants of where we might classify a neuromechanical stress or a neurological stress or a metabolic stress. And then we plot those exercises in different spots. So if swimming always takes place. So for a freestyle swimmer, it takes place in what we would call our lower right quadrant, which is unloaded because there's no external resistance mm -hmm. uh, added to the, to the skill. And it's we call it multiplanar training because they're moving they're rotating and having to pull in the pull in the water um, in the sagittal plane. So because it's multi multiplanar, we would put it down there. Whereas breaststroke is one quadrant over. It's unloaded linear training because I'm mm -hmm. not rotating, right? Right. And so if those are the cases, and this is where I spend most of my time down here, I might train over here, mm -hmm. right? Just to offset the tr total amount of training load that somebody's going through from a neuromechanical standpoint. So neuro mean neurological, mechanical mean biomechanical. So if if you're doing too much, you're you're overloading, you're you're numbing it. What are you doing to it? Yeah, if I if I train in the same realm or in the right. same quadrant over and over and over and over right. again, those tissues are subservient responders to training stress, mm -hmm. right? So eventually, there's going to be an overuse stress to it. Mm. So that's where we start to get tendinopathies and we start to get um, tissues that are overloaded, um, our recovery is affected, or we're spending so much time trying to recover from a particular tissue that we've overloaded that now when we go into the gym and we say, well, my shoulder's weak. Well, is it weak because I've done too much for it? Or is it weak because I actually can't produce any force? In mm. a lot of cases, the nervous system won't allow it to produce any force because it's trying to tell you to shut it down. Right, right. right and yeah. then that's how we get overuse injuries is that we're doing too much repetitive strain on a particular tissue or a particular movement pattern. And so that's why I'm like, do something different than the gym. When you go yeah. to the gym, don't try to simulate swimming. Yeah. Right? This is yes. an opportunity psychologically for you to do something different than being in the pool, which mm. is probably your biggest win than mm. what you would do biomechanically, right? Yeah. The biggest yeah. win would be how do I not overload this person psychologically as well as neuromechanically right. or metabolically for that matter too.
You, I read in your bio, you talked about something called uh, micro dosing movement. What's that? Yeah. So um, what we've done about, well, geez, about 10 years ago, uh, my buddy Dan and I, um, well, Dan actually approached me and he said, John, like, I want to get my grandma fit and moving a little bit better because she loves to garden and she wants to be in the garden in the spring, but she's always in pain when she does that. She goes, is there anything that we could do to prepare, prepare somebody for the demands of that particular activity without her having to go to the gym? Because there's no way my grandma's going to the gym. And I was like, well, yeah, like everything in sport and in activity is really about preparation, right? So if you think about any job that we do or every, any task that we have to do, you're going to prepare for it, or at least you should. And so I said, well, maybe we should come up with like little things that she could do before she goes into the garden. Then when she has break for lunch, she can teach her those same things again to prepare the body to handle the rigors of gardening, just like we would with a hockey player or a swimmer or a baseball player. What would we do to prepare her body for that? And so, so he goes, well, how many movements do you think we do? And I said, well, I, I would do it in seven movements. And that's how our company became, became born. It was called seven, we started wow. called seven movements. And the whole essence behind it was the fitness industry and the sporting industry is really good of creating dosages of stress that are highly challenging to overcome. And usually the durations could be anywhere from 45 to 90 minutes or longer of stress that the body's under. The problem is we've got, you know, the fitness industry serves about 20% of the population, but the 80% that don't can't handle the stresses and the doses of of training that is happening if you went to a gym right so we came up with this concept and you'll see it in the literature it's called exercise snacks but it's the idea of just taking uh, functional specific movements that you might do to uh, help counter strain what's going on in your life but we do it in shorter doses so if we took as an example if i take a regular a group exercise class found in a group exercise studio that's maybe 45 or 60 minutes and we had that as like a pill i'm going to take that pill and i'm going to cut it into quarters right and we might only do just a small little bit of that and so that's what we came up with with micro dosing is if i can do seven different movements one minute at a time and then do that more frequently throughout the day in the aggregate it's going to amount to as much as if I did four times a day, that's 28 minutes of activity. Mm, well, yeah. well, the, you know, World Health Organization has said that we need to have about 30 minutes of activity every single day in order to maintain health. Gotcha. Well, we said, well, those people can't handle those doses right off the bat, right? Especially anything that's pretty challenging for them. So what we did is we said, we'll give you little bits that you're going to do throughout the day. And the research that we're involved in, we're partnered with the University of British Columbia and McMaster University in Canada. And we're now publishing some of our te uh, researching and then publishing some of the, the results from this is showing improvements in cardiovascular health. It's showing improvements in strength. But what we're doing is we're just adding little doses at a time. And at the end, biology aggregates all that effectiveness and economy and efficiency that happens. And we get a biological uh, response from it. Well, that makes sense. Um, I'm, I'm micro dosing on food, uh, you know, every, <laughs> every every like 20 minutes, a little snack here, snack there. So why don't I just drop down and give myself three push-ups and do that 20 times a day, you know? There you go. You it's going to add up, right? 100%. And so that's what, like, when I have a particular athlete that struggles with pull-ups, right? Mm. Like, there's a good example. It's hard to do of a really large number of pull-ups unless you you have ridiculous relative body strength. So what we would do is say, you know, every hour go do two or three of them. You know, if you have access mm. to them, you do a pull-up, mm. work on mm. it because that now becomes a skill. But yep. you're slowly drip feeding that um, that dosage into the tissues and then the mm. nervous system starts to become more efficient at it, more efficient at it, more efficient at it, and eventually you get stronger and stronger and stronger at it. I like this. I like this theory. I'm on. I'm into it now. I'm really digging it. Yeah. <laughs> well, You're gonna have to really... send me some more research on this. Yeah, we're doing a cool research study right now with uh, the University of British Columbia and McMaster. Um, we're measuring the effect of two groups: a control group and a cardiovascular group. Mm -hmm. And um, the control group 
Uh, I can't really get too much into it because it's going on right now because I don't want to, if anyone heard this, I wouldn't want to influence the study at all. But yeah. um, essentially, we're trying to measure the effect of these microdoses on cardiorespiratory fitness as a mean, as a preventative um, application to prevent cancer. Mm. Wow. Damn. So if we could wow. teach people to change the way that they dose exercise, mm. we might be able to change the whole thought process of how we get people more active. Because if I, I get like more people to do just little bits at a time, instead of nothing at all, we will actually make a, a positive impact on cancer, obesity, heart disease, all the co comorbidities that we're dealing with right now. And I think what you're also doing too is you're creating a um, kind of a, a, a something that's in your daily schedule where it's like a you know it's just part, it's a habit right you're creating yeah. a habit that's the word i was looking for is that's like right. you know every every hour if i've got to go and do two pull-ups that's just part of a habit that i'm going to get into over time and then eventually you're not even going to think about it right it's just it's just something that's in your schedule your daily schedule it's like okay two pull up boom 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 and then you look back in a couple of weeks maybe a couple of months and you're you're, you're killing it compared to where you were and you, and you probably don't even know at the time. You're just like, Oh, look how much better I've got at this. And how did that happen? Oh, well, I put it in my daily routine. Right. So. Yep. Yeah. Well, I'm, gl I'm glad you said that about um, building habits because a lot of the times the, the behavior around exercise is that it's not as high as a priority because mm. it, if I have uh, more barriers to have to overcome in terms of time, family, work, everything else we tend to push well I'll do exercise maybe when I get home and then other things get in the way and then we don't do it mm -hmm. so the best part about that is if we can start building a habit that makes you feel a lot better that's the other challenge too most exercise doses are so high I feel terrible after I've done it right mm -hmm. and, uh, but if we can do it so that you know that was a challenge but I actually feel better I have more energy uh, my body doesn't hurt um, I actually feel like it improved my mobility, uh, my posture is better. If I can start aggregating all those things that have an external reward to it, then people will start to put the effort into, I'm going to do this one particular thing as my new habit throughout the day and mm. then see how it ladders up. And we've got a saying that is, um, you know, if I can get you to move a little bit better, you'll want to move more. Mm. I'm always wanting to do more more push-ups right like push-ups is like i want i want push-ups to be part of my daily routine but i'm always thinking like oh man i gotta get 50 to 100 in at a time and right. just don't i just don't want to do that whereas i'm walking up and down these steps that i've got here every day so instead of just walking up the steps maybe if i just drop give myself five push-ups before i walk up the steps and every time i do that now all of a sudden i've got my 50 to 100 push-ups in by just by my daily routine of walking up and down the steps right that's brilliant because what you've done is you've you've done two things. One, you've created an environment for that to take place, but you also created a condition in order for that to take place. Mm. Like in order for me to get up the stairs, I have to do five push-ups. Right. right? It, it's like Pavlovian's mm. uh, psychology, yeah, right? Yeah, you, yeah. Hear, you hear a ding, oh, there's a treat there. It's the same yeah. thing, but what you've done is you've created the conditions for that to happen. And that's crucial in developing habits, right? Mm. Yeah. The well, reason you, why you, you brush your teeth when you first get exactly. up in the morning yeah, and brushing you go your teeth. to bed at night. It's Routine, yeah. It's like it's attached to something else, mm -hmm. and we call that habit stacking. So mm -hmm. once I get that, then you're going to be like, well, I'm also going to do five push-ups before I leave the door, before I leave the house. Uh, right? John, John, you've just changed my life, man. Look at this. <laughs> <laughs> because I've wanted to do it. I just haven't figured out how to do it. And now I've got like this, okay, that makes sense to me. I can do that. Five yeah. push-ups, walk up the stairs come back down, do a little bit of work, five push-ups, walk up the stairs. Yeah, I'm into it. I'm done. It. I'm doing it. You watch me a month from now. I'm going to be all fit and jacked up top, so I'll be good. <laughs> <laughs> um, I appreciate this, man. This has been good. There's been a lot of stuff in here. Where can people find out more about you other than uh, any question where you're doing a brilliant job and I want them to go and ask you questions? Where else can they find you? Yeah, our website is www.7movements.com, and that is uh, the company that we do all the microdosing from um it's a opportunity for people to sign up for free they can sign up and they'll get our daily dose so uh, it gets emailed to you as a choice do you want to do a mobility exercise do you want to do a strength related exercise and then uh, we just help guide you through the process of dipping your toe in the water of exercise right we don't ask you to jump right in the deep end we're going to ask you to wade for a little while so you can go up and you can sign up for that 
And then um, you can also reach me on Instagram. My Instagram is at authentic health coach. Cool. Nice. We'll put these in the in the show notes too so people can see it down the bottom. Um, John, I appreciate your time, man. You're doing good work. Keep it up, all right? Thanks, bud. I appreciate you having me. Yeah, man. Take care. Bye. Take care. We individualize training in the pool, so why not individualize your nutrition? Erica Biney of Biney Wellness Building will help you and your swimmers get exactly what each athlete needs through genetic testing and personalized nutrition plans. So stop guessing what you should and shouldn't be putting into your body. Athletes within a few weeks have noticed they're recovering faster because they're fueling their body with what they need and staying away from what their body hates. Erica understands swimming. She gets it. She's worked with over 20 Olympians, including the fastest man in the world, Caleb Dressel. Group discounts are available. So go to Biney Wellness Building and get in touch with Erica today. That's Biney, B-E-I-N-E, wellnessbuilding.net. Swim Angelfish. Swim Angelfish is an online certification program that strengthens your teaching curriculum to serve swimmers of all abilities. Swim Angelfish will prepare you and your instructors with the skills to teach swimmers with autism, physical disabilities, anxiety, sensory and motor conditions, and more. Learn to teach skills faster and with more comfort with Swim Angelfish. Apply for an only alpha pool product scholarship and receive up to 50% off your certification. Go to swimangelfish.com today to apply.